Okay, everybody want to wish you a good morning on this beautiful April 15th. It is, uh, the sun is shining. It's a little cold today, but it's still really clear. Uh, we are uh, broadcasting live from New Jersey in our indiv individual homes, or we're all working remotely. This is Todd Polanak, and I am a partner in the uh, not-for-profit niche leader for SACS. And you are tuned in today to Preparing for Recovery, what not-for-profits should start doing now, N-O-W, now. So this slide here, we always have to show this slide to tell you that the purpose of these webinars is to provide general guidance only. Um, so it doesn't const constitute legal advice, tax advice, accounting services, investment advice, or professional con consulting of any kind. So please uh, consult your professional advisor on the pertinent facts that relate to your situation. So here's today's agenda. We have um, a nice lineup, and I just want to point out this is part one of a series on preparing for recovery. So we're going to start with the introduction, which is what we're doing now. We're going to move to managing cash flow. We're going to be talking a little bit about the opportunities for tax planning and also how to infuse your organization with cash uh, through its, the SBA programs. And then we have some Q&A to talk to you about. So this is the lineup. This is our lovely faces. Todd uh, is myself, partner at SACS. Al Traverso is my partner, as well as Marcus White. We are not dressed the way that you see in these pictures. At least I know I'm not dressed in a suit. Not so sure about Al and Marcus because they didn't have their webcam turned on this morning. So I'm going to turn this over to my partner, Al. He's going to start off by telling you. Um, what you need to start doing now concerning managing your cash flow. Al? Thanks, Todd. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm going to be talking about cash flow. And uh, the slide you see there, cash is king. As we all know, it's the lifeblood of any organization. That inflow and outflow of the cash is what keeps things moving. Um, so we're going to touch on some topics on what not-for-profits could and should be doing now to make sure that they stay on top of their current cash flows. So we're going to talk about things like knowing your balance, using cash flow forecasting, cost containment, managing the working capital within the organization, and we'll talk about some sources of finance that, that can help to support the organization's cash flows. So knowing your balance. Um, what's up on the screen here, I went back in preparing uh, to present here, I went back through some client files and found some examples of what um, clients are doing to just be familiar with and stay on top of what their cash balances are. And an example, what you have here, it's a very uh, simple, straightforward da daily look at the cash balances and the inflows and outflows. Part of uh, the keys to, to maintaining this, obviously, is making sure that the transactions for all of the cash receipts and all of the cash disbursements, that they are recorded uh, timely on a daily basis. And this information is used um, by management in order to just stay on top of what those, uh, what the current balances are. It gives them a little bit of a look. You know, what you have here is just a sample. This report is actually uh, quite extensive in terms of the view, the timeline that it shows. Uh, but what's also important is off to the right, you'll see that it also keeps a very important number and a date off to the side about when payables are due. Um, you know, and that there is an amount that is due for, for those payables so that management can quickly see, you know, what does our payables look like versus our cash balance today. 
And <clears throat> again, a very simple, straightforward daily view just to help management understand where their balances are. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is another example um, from, from a different client on, on their balances and what they're doing. And you can see here, we certainly have a lot more information. Um, it is a little bit more complicated in the fact that it is not only tracking the historical ins and outs uh, up on the top above the yellow line, those are the actual historicals, and the uh, today's date is the is the amount uh, just for uh, actually for today. And then we have forecasted amounts down below. Now, there's a lot more information on here than the previous example, but what this particular client has done is on outflows, which tend to be certainly more predictable um, and easier to determine what those outflows are going to be than inflows, they've broken out their outflows into two basic main categories, the traditional payables, and then their payroll and benefits cash out. Um, and in the example here, this particular client has a weekly payroll. And you can see that that is a, a similar amount occurring each week. They have their benefits, which are occurring once a month. And then on the payables, they do their pay runs uh, each Friday. And so this is, this is a tool that they are using to track uh, their cash flows. Now, uh, on the cash in, you can see that there are amounts that they have filled in beyond today's date. And those are essentially estimates. And those estimates are based on historical trends. Um, I believe that not for profits do need to be thinking about and understand how they are currently trending, because I am sure that under the current situation that we're all in, you know, uh, trends are changing and have changed and, and may continue to change, which is why I think not-for-profits do need to look at and consider looking at those changes in their balances on a more frequent basis than, than monthly. I do think weekly or even daily, depending on the situation and how volatile those numbers are, so that management can get a, a handle on and understand what the current trends are. Um, you know, historical trends, models that may have been put together in the past, um, those models may not be accurate any longer, depending on how your cash flow has been impacted by what's going on. Next slide, please. So as I said before, you know, the outflows, you know, the, the outflows and the inflows are somewhat uh, their guesses, but they're educated guesses, you know, based on that understanding of what's going on within your organization. Um, whether you have a fee for service type contracts or you have cost reimbursement type contracts, um, it's important to understand the timing of those dollars coming in. And certainly on the fee-for-service side, uh, whatever a not-for-profit can do to accelerate um, the, the billing for those services, um, it may, perhaps maybe you're, if you're able to change your billing frequency uh, to, you know, to, uh, to expedite the, the cash receipts on those billings, um, that would be something certainly to look into. On cost reimbursement grants, um, the frequency tends to just be monthly, but perhaps your grants would provide for um, a more frequent uh, type of reimbursement uh, timing. So that is something that should also be explored. When it comes to estimating what you have sitting out there on your receivables, you know, looking again at the trends, what's the turnover? Uh, how has that turnover or the days uh, in billings that are sitting in AR, how has that been trending? And, and using the most current up-to-date uh, trending numbers when you're trying to develop your, your cash flow forecast looking out into the future. 
And I would say that when you are looking out into the future and trying to predict what your cash flow is going to look like, I do believe that um, a 13 week timeline is probably as far out as I would go. You know, that's about, that's about three months. Anything beyond that, I think really gets fuzzy. And even, even three months may be a little fuzzy, but I would not go beyond that. So in estimating the, out, uh, the inflows, not-for-profit should also be thinking about and considering, you know, where are your current billings and your level of service estimates uh, on the fee-for-service side uh, of, your, of your contracts? Um, certainly, you know, with staff now working remotely, um, staff maybe not having the ability to make the contacts to consumers that uh, it was able to in the past. This has certainly caused an impact on a not-for-profit's ability to, to generate the revenues, which, which in turn results in those cash flows coming in. So a not-for-profit does need to consider when developing its model, what's the capacity, what staff, uh, what are they able to actually do today with the consumers that you're serving and build that into the model. Because again, I think trends um, you know, very well may have changed from where the organization has been historically. And depending on what the ability is and the capacity of your staff is, um, those targets should be set and communicated to the staff so that they understand what they need to do in order um, you know, to do their part to help the organization fulfill its mission, uh, but also keep that cash flow coming. And then of course, uh, you know, hindsight's always 2020, and when you have a forecast, it's always a good idea to certainly compare where you were forecasting to those actual results, analyze where those differences are coming from, look at what caused those differences, what was your assumption when you built the forecast versus what actually happened. Um, this will help you to get an understanding as to you know, what, what is causing these differences, but also help you to maybe tweak your assumption um, as you as you continue on with the forecast and sharpen the pencil uh, going forward. Uh, it bears noting that you know forecasts on cash flows, you know the primary tool of that is to help an organization to deal with the shortfalls ca caused by the timing of inflows and outflows. Um, you know receivables may be billed because uh, some of your you know, some of your sources, they're a little slow on paying, but you're still incurring your expenses and it's going to create a shortfall. Um, but again, <clears throat> cash flows is, is only is used to predict um, what's going to happen. However, no amount of cash flow forecasting can fix a, an overall fundamental issue if the organization uh, is in a situation where revenues are just out of sync with expenses. And so the next step in dealing with cash flow, I think not for profits should be, if they haven't already, start to re-examine your budgets. Where are you in terms of you know, your budget versus actual, as well as what should the budget look like going forward from this point, because things certainly have changed. And it's imperative that not-for-profits are re-examining and making sure that their revenues and costs are in alignment um, and that if they do have deficits and they don't have the reserves to cover those deficits, changes will need to be made. Um, otherwise, the cash flow uh, situation you know, will deteriorate rapidly. So budgets, you know, have they been revised? Um, something definitely to look at. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, on the revenue side, what's the organization's ability to generate those revenues? What's the capacity? What can, you know, what cl can clinic staff do? Can they get the access to be able to generate those revenues? Um, you know, that is, that's going to be key. 
Um, and certainly speaking with your funding sources and getting an understanding um, of you know, what assistance they can provide um, and possibly speaking to them about, again, as I mentioned, stepping up the, the billing cycle or stepping up the cost reimbursement uh, requests to, to accelerate those inflows back into the organization. In this time of uncertainty, uh, as it is, you know, even just be before this happened, uh, hopefully not-for-profits had or, or were thinking about those what-if scenarios, you know, what if something happens? Um, and I think now more than ever, not-for-profits should also be thinking about what if, even from this point, you know, there's been change uh, already that's occurred. There is certainly the possibility for more change to come down the road. And, you know, being prepared for that and looking at those what if scenarios and coming up with contingency plans uh, is something that all not for profits should be doing. And now looking again, also looking at the programs, you know, this is also a time I think for not for profits to take a second look, look back at the various programs, which ones are generating surpluses, which ones are generating deficits. Um, and really examining what the organization is going to be able to support going forward um, based on that second look of, you know, the, of a revised budget, um, for cash flow forecasts, and what really is going to be the organization's ability to sustain the various programs that it currently has. Managing the working capital. So, one of the things that not-for-profits probably have more control of, actually any organization has more control of, is the outflows than the inflows. Um, leveraging the AP and stretching your vendor payments is certainly something not-for-profits should be looking to do. Also though, being mindful of the, the partnerships and key relationships that you have um, with those who support your organization. I do think that not-for-profits should ask for a discount um you know this is um these are difficult times and uh your partners uh, may very well be able to or be willing to give you a discount it certainly can't hurt to ask um as someone once uh, had said to me you know you, you know what will happen if you don't ask so why not ask the frequency of billings um look to increase that frequency but also on the fee for service side uh, look at those billing errors and make sure that those are getting fixed as quickly as possible and resubmitted. Donor pledges for organizations that are that have long-term pledges. Um, now might be a good time to approach uh, those donors for an advance uh, on a timed uh, pledge if it was a long-term pledge with multiple installments in addition to uh, possibly asking that donor for a change in the restricted purpose, if you're in a situation where the donor has placed a restriction uh, that the funds be used for something specific, maybe now is the time to ask uh, for a, a modification to what that restricted purpose is. And then if not-for-profits do have underutilized assets, um, you know, maybe uh, look to sell those assets and monetize those um, if they're currently not being used in, in the mission purpose. For sources of finance, um, certainly I think not-for-profits should look to their board members for guidance to assist to, um, to, to bring in revenues uh, and, and speak with those that they're connected with and, and the, the other stakeholders within the organization. Uh, line of credit, uh, now is a good time for not-for-profits to look at their line of credit to see what their capacity is on the line. Certainly be mindful of when it's time for renewal and think about when it's time to even draw down on the line to make sure that the organization does have um, the cash at the ready should it need it. And then of course, um, what we've all been hearing about the SBA loans that are out there, the PPP loan and the uh, the EIDL loan, certainly not-for-profits qualify, they should be applying. And if you haven't, um, you really should. Time is running out, but there's still an opportunity.
And thank you. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Marcus. Okay, good morning all. Hope uh, all of you are faring well in these trying times. Uh, we're going to look at tax planning opportunities uh, for tax exempts and move right into the, the slides here. So, uh, first and foremost, the uh, IRS issued notice 2020-23 uh, extending due dates, uh, and then it was confirmed for our exempt orgs um, on yesterday uh, with the exempt uh, org update that the May 15th deadline has been extended as well. So, for our 990 series, uh, which are traditionally due for calendar year ends on May 15th, it is now extended to July 15th as well as uh, for our fiscal year in June 30, 19, which was a final extension due date of May 15th. And that has also been uh, extended to July 15th. Uh, for our states, New Jersey, uh, no guidance received yet, but um, they are due on June 30th for both the fiscal and calendar year. Uh, as you remember, uh, we're going on the second year now, almost third year, whereas it's mandatory that the, the Jersey CRI series has to be filed on the website. So uh, stay tuned to see what's going on with that. And New York has followed suit with the CHAR 500, as well as the CT13 auto extending the calendar, as well as the fiscal June 30 to uh, November 15th of 2020. Okay, uh, some changes for uh, our individual tax um, payers. So the required minimum distribution rules, RMD, um, you know, once you're over 70 and a half, which was now moved to 72, uh, you're required to take out a minimum distribution based on actuarial tables. Uh, so for now, for 2020, that has been waived. So individuals do not have to pull money out of their uh, retirement plans. Also, uh, in the case of a death of an employee, uh, there's a five-year time period where the money has to be taken out uh, by the designated beneficiary or beneficiaries. Uh, under the CARES Act, this period now it, it, um, takes 2020 out of the equation. So if an employee died in 19, normally they have to pull the money out by 24. Now they actually have till 2025 to move that money out. Reasoning behind this was uh, because of the market, um, the drastic drop in the account balances and the values of the accounts would basically deplete a lot of employees' uh, retirement. So uh, um, the part of the legislative act was to try to preserve uh, people's retirement. So this piece of it was uh, deemed uh, uh, advisable for um, for our taxpayers and to, to get through this critical times. Okay, some enhancements for our individuals. Again, for non-itemizers, uh, you now can take an above the line deduction of $300 um, for non-itemizing taxpayers. This is to help encourage our young uh, taxpayers to give. Also for taxpayers who really don't own homes or have other itemized deductions, that normally they're gonna take a standard. Uh, so this is an increase to help stimulate giving for our, our seasoned taxpayers or our regular itemizers. Uh, you can now give compatible contributions up to 100 percent of your 2020 AGI. Now, um, you know, when tax reform, when the Tax Cuts Jobs Act came out, uh, we increased the limit from 50 to 60 percent and giving various uh, lectures and seminars. I asked how many people give 50% of their AGI to charity, and you normally don't get that uh, response there. Uh, but in these times, a lot of business owners are going to take heavy hits in their businesses. There are going to be losses, and there are some who really, truly still give uh, to the charities that are near and dear to them. So 100% uh, of AGI is not going to be unheard of in these times. So um, what's a qualified charitable contribution? Cash, good, hard, cold cash, okay? It's gotta be cash and it's gotta be made to public charities, okay? And the caveats are, it can't be a donor advised fund, it can't be a supporting organization. So they're really looking to get money, uh, infusion in money from the general public 
into charities that are actually performing services and providing services to, to the individuals of their mission. For our businesses, um, food inventory, the uh, income limit, uh, taxable income limit is moved up from 15% to 25% of taxable income. So for our Wake Ferns, for our Amazon Whole Foods, this is a tremendous benefit. They are actually one of the few industries that is on the rise. Uh, their profits are up. Uh, they have a lot of money and inventory to give. So um, looking for our food service industries to really step up and give inventories to our nonprofits. Also corporations, uh, normally it's a 10% of taxable income. Now that's moved up to 25% for 2020. So again, uh, we need to stay in front of those types of donor bases. Okay, takeaways here, it's gotta be a qualified contribution. So um, if you have non-qualified contributions, that's gonna be taken first in these limitations and then the qualified second. So when uh, preparers are bearing returns, you're talking to your clients, um, just realize that we've got a pecking order here that we've got to adhere to. Okay, for our nonprofits that have unrelated business income, okay, UBI, okay, and just very, very quickly, UBI is basically income that is not related to our organization's mission, okay? So the treatment of that is the same as a C corporation. So Tax, just, uh, tax Cuts Jobs Act, had uh, made some modifications to unrelated business income. And now here the CARES Act is kind of removing some of those restrictions. So one of the things are the net operating loss carry forwards. Uh, in the past, before 2018, uh, you were able to deduct 100% of your NOLs, your net operating loss carry forwards against current year income. That percentage was reduced to 80%. And now uh, for years beginning uh, before January 1, 2021, you'll be able to go back to that 100% um, NOL deduction. Also, uh, the AMT credits, um, they have been accelerated now. So if you are carrying alternative minimum tax credits from prior years, there's a refund acceleration that you can get to, again, infuse money back into our nonprofits. Also, one of the big changes for from the Tax Cuts Jobs Act was an interest limitation under Section 163J. Uh, and it basically took um, your adjusted taxable income, which was basically income adding back the interest, adding back depreciation, amortization, and multiplying it by 30%. That was the limit on interest expense that you can deduct for the current year. Um, the CARES Act has now moved that to a 50%. So you really want to look at your 19 and also 2020 projections. If you file 19 returns, take a look at it. Um, maybe you can go back and amend and uh, get some money back on a uh, increased deduction for your interest expense. And the last modifications to loss limitations. Uh, again, for uh, our exempt trusts, there was a limit of $250,000 that you could deduct annually. Uh, this is, has been removed and, also, and now you can actually uh, basically uh, get some larger deductions for your net operating loss and current year losses. Okay, um, last week, uh, two of my partners was on a webcast and they gave a very deep dive uh, into these uh, payroll tax incentives. So this is just a quick chart on the various credits. Um, just to get it in there for today, uh, the first one is the employee retention credit. Uh, no limit on employees, okay? Uh, but you cannot uh, have this credit if you've applied and received the um, payroll protection program loan. And the period um, of this is March 13th through December 31st. Second credit is the deferral of payroll taxes. Uh, again, you, you the employer portion of the payroll tax can be deferred uh, and paid into installments, which would be uh, December 31st, 2020 and December 31st, 2021. Um, again, no limit on employees. You can defer the payroll tax credit payment until the PPP loan is forgiven, okay? So that was guidance that came out late last week on that piece of it. And the period is from March, uh, seven, uh, March 27th through December 31st. 
Next, the employer credit for paid sick leave um, it is available only for employers who have less than 500 employees. You can um, get this credit uh, if you have the loans forgiven, uh, but you just can't use the same wages. So if you have wages in excess of what you use to pay for the PPP and was forgiven, you can take this employer credit, the sick leave credit on those remaining wages. And the period here is April 1st through December 31st. And the last, the employer credit for family sick leave. Again, a limit of 500 employees. Again, same piece with the uh, guidance with the PPP loan. If you add excess wages, uh, you could take that credit on the payroll page uh, wages that were not forgiven through the PPP loan. And again, April through December 31st, 2020. Okay, I'll turn the, the remaining section over the webcast to uh, Todd, who's going to talk about the loans and the infusions of cash. Thank you, Marcus. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the SBA loans and uh, how to get some cash into your not-for-profit. Now, just before we start on this, just to let you know, we've done a few seminars already on this. This is a recap. And I am going to talk a little bit about the forgiveness portion of, and specifically related to the PPP loan, but there's going to be a deeper dive on that in tomorrow's uh, webinar, which is going to be at 10 o'clock, which we'll talk a little bit about towards the end. But the very first loan that I want to chat with you about is the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, it To qualify for this, uh, particular loan. There's some very specific things that uh, you need to follow. You need to also understand that this has a $10 million maximum loan balance. It's based upon a formula. And the forgiveness, there's forgiveness that is available um, on this loan to a certain extent that we'll get into in a moment. Differences exist between the use of the funds and the funds that are eligible for forgiveness. So in this particular program, there are certain things that you must use the loan for, and there are certain things that will be eligible to be forgiven and some that will not. The application process uh, needs to be completed at an SBA designated bank. There's quite a few banks that have taken applications that we know of, and there's been quite a few folks that we've spoken to who have been notified this week that the money is coming. So that's good news. But we do know from our discussions with our colleagues and the banks in particular that the best way to get this loan, if you haven't applied yet, is to go to your current banking relationship for the specifics of the application. Just know that different banks are requesting a different information and they're doing this application uh, differently. So it's going to depend upon your bank as to what they're going to require. And if this loan is not forgiven, it has a two-year amortization, which is 24 months, at a 1% interest rate, but the first six months, the interest and the principal is deferred, but the interest does start accruing from the very beginning. The idle loan, the economic industry, in, the economic injury disaster loan, it's a little bit different. This is another loan that's available to you. There is a $2 million max loan balance. It is based on the SBA's discretion. There is, with this loan, a net worth and taxable income limitations. And the detailed application process actually goes through the SBA. You would apply on the SBA website. There is no forgiveness aspect to this loan. So we often talk about the, 
Paycheck Protection Program or the PPP as free money because there's an opportunity to have a portion or all of it forgiven. But with the EIDL loan, there is uh, no forgiveness. However, there is a $10,000 advance, a uh, potential $10,000 advance, which you don't need to repay. Just some further um, information on that. It appears that the SBA is actually um, limiting the $10,000 amount up so that it's based upon the number of employees. So it's $1,000 for each employee. So if you have under 10 employees, you may not get the $10,000 advance. It's a 30 year amortization period, it needs to be paid back in 30 years. And for not for profits, the interest rate is 2.75%. And for for profits, it's 3.75% interest rate. So this is a, a caveat um, that I am not going to go through all the aspects of forgiveness for the PPP loan. There will be a deeper dive um, on this topic in tomorrow's webinar on forgiven and unforgivable loans. That's tomorrow that you can sign up for uh, Thursday at 10 o'clock. But I'm going to give you some highlights. And the other thing I want to note here is that the SBA has made it very clear that they're going to provide additional guidance on how this loan is forgiven. We thought it was important for not-for-profits to get have some idea because um, you're getting the money now. First, it's clear that as far as the forgiveness aspect of the loan is concerned, that in the interim final rule, and now it's been clarified again, the SBA is saying that at least 75% of the forgivable amount of the loan has to be spent on payroll cost. They came up with this um, rationale as to why it's 75% um, based upon that equation above. I don't know how they came up with the six, 76 days. But payroll costs include compensation of employees That are whose principal place of residence is in the US, which includes wages, salaries, commissions, or similar compensation, payment of vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, allowance for separation or dismissal. It also includes payment of provision of employee benefits consisting of group health care coverage, including insurance premiums retirement, and payment of state and local taxes assessed on employee compensation. So what do the payroll costs not include? They don't include compensation of employees in excess of $100,000. Uh, however, non-cash benefits are included. It doesn't include federal employment taxes withheld, and it doesn't include the qualified sick and family leave wages for which a credit is allowed under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Now you need to also understand that uh, only 25% of the loan to be forgiven over the eight week period can be used on something that is non-payroll related. So it's payments on interest on mortgage obligations incurred before February 15th, 2020, rent payments on leases dated before February 15th, 2020, and utility payments under service agreements dated before uh, February 15th, 2020. So this relates to the forgiveness factor. The other aspect to this is that 
your forgiveness, you may have an amount that is forgivable, but it's clear that since the intent of this program is for you to retain employees and to keep their wages uh, the same, that uh, forgiveness is reduced by any change in the FTE headcount between the period, the covered period when you receive the loan, and also the prior period that it's measured against. And forgiveness may also be reduced by any individual whose pay was re reduced by 25% or greater between those periods. But there is a relief portion in the program that if you either rehire or restore um, employees to their wages by June 30th, 2020, individuals who you either let go or you reduce their salaries, that this is not going to count against you. So before we go to the frequently asked questions, let me just make one or two more comments on forgiveness. Like I said, there'll be a deeper dive in the next seminar. And I also want you to know that there's a lot of uncertainties because when the, both the law was written and the interim final rule was written, uh, I don't think that folks were really focusing on the forgiveness aspect of the loan they were more focused on the uh, getting the loan. So we'll cover more of that later, but let's turn to uh, some frequently asked questions and I'll, I'll let you answer the first one. Uh, okay, thank you, Todd. Um, so the question is, if I have applied and received the PPP loan and it is forgiven, what impact might it have on my government grants and other funding sources? Uh, any advice on what I should do in managing this? Okay, that's a that's a good question. Um, for for not for profits, I think uh, the forgiven aspect of this loan uh, is something that needs to be considered, uh, especially when it comes to uh, an organization's cost reimbursement grants. Um, funds that are forgiven under the PPP loan, I think that there is a potential that for those cost reimbursement grants, those funding sources may very well look to recapture because uh, they will view it as kind of like a, a double dip on the funding. Um, so not-for-profits, I think, need to be aware of that. And in speaking with my clients, I haven't heard that that they've that there's any word out there yet from from state agencies here in New Jersey um, that there's any thoughts at this point about. <laughs> It's going to be impacted, um, but I do think not-for-profits need to be thinking in those terms. Additionally, um, what I think not-for-profits should be doing is making sure that they, similar to how they are, are already tracking your expenditures by funding source, I think it's uh, important that the not-for-profits are tracking these PPP funds and how they are being spent so that you'll be able to clearly demonstrate to a funding source whether or not that program benefited from the forgiveness. And that will help a not-for-profit be able to support to the funding source if they are looking to recapture, you know, you can demonstrate whether or not any of the forgiven funds actually related to or impacted those particular grants. So I think that's um, that's how I would uh, answer that question. Um, looking at the next question, Marcus, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so let's see. With the tax law changes that have in that have impacted donors, what specific action steps should I take? So um, first and foremost, um, I look at the extended filing dates for the 990 series, and I would not wait to take advantage of that. Uh, I would uh, advise that we get the 990s done as soon as possible for our June 30s. If they're still hanging out there, let's get them done for our calendar years. Uh, if your um, reviews or comps or audits are done, 
let's get these done. You know, our funding sources need them. Uh, any grants that we request need them. Um, and then any potential donors uh, like to see our 990. So let's get it done. It's a marketing tool, not just a compliance tool. Um, and, and let's make sure we're in line there and in compliance. Next, I would stay in front of my donors. Um, for our young donors, again, this $300 above the line deduction um, is an, uh, an incentive for them to give and take a deduction for it. For our seasoned donors, um, with the AGI limit increases, uh, we still want to make sure that they know we are still in need of their support more than ever. And the corporate donors, the increase of the um, food inventory as well as taxable income. Um, these are all incentives to continuously give to our, uh, our nonprofits, and we need to make sure that we're in front of our donors and uh, they understand that there are increased limits and other reasons, tax incentives for them to give. Uh, oh, the next question might be me as well. Let's see. The same question related to new retirement rules. Okay. So we talked about the required minimum distribution rules and the changes in those. Um, one, make sure that nonprofits understand um, many taxpayers use um, qualified retirement distributions to, to basically satisfy uh, this requirement. And uh, the IRS put out some years ago that you would basically be able to take the distribution and immediately give it to a, non, a qualified nonprofit. And that now you wouldn't have to pull that into income. And that's a way of giving that uh, basically keeps their AGI down and satisfies their, their donation requirements. With now having not to take this minimum, that may be a shrinkage in funding for our nonprofits. So we need to make sure we account for that. If this is a, a decent portion of your contributions, you wanna make sure you're aware that uh, this piece is, may not be coming in. Um, we know the market has taken horrible hits in Q1, Q2, probably in Q3. Um, Q4, we need to see what it looks like. Uh, if it does come back, some people may go ahead and take the required minimum distributions. Uh, I think we, the, our nonprofits have to be very, very astute in, uh, in understanding what's going on in the market, as well as these tax rules. Uh, let's see, next question. That's probably you, Todd. Okay, it said, um, we did not apply for the PPP loan because we had more than 500 employees. But in a prior webinar, it was said that there was additional guidance given by the SBA that may enable us to take the to apply for the PPP anyway. What is it? I think what that's referring to is back in um, I think it was April 7th or April 8th, the um, SBA came out with some additional guidance, and in that, as far as eligibility, they mentioned another possible category of of organizations that were greater than 500 employees besides the, um, some other exceptions to the rule that could possibly apply and i believe it had something to do with um, if your tangible net worth was um, under 15 million dollars and if your net income i guess this, in the case of a not-for-profit it would be your increase in your net assets. If your um, increase in your net assets for the prior two fiscal periods was under five million dollars, there would be a possibility to apply. So I would encourage those um, organizations, not for profits, to take a look at that part of the clarified rules and speak to your bank to see if you didn't apply, maybe there is a possibility that you can apply under those that particular clarification in the rules. So I'll turn the next one over to Al. Thanks, Todd. Um, so this question here, many of our special events were canceled because of the pandemic, quarantines, and this has resulted in a significant loss in revenue. What are some ways we can reduce the impact of the loss? 
Um, yeah, that's uh, we're, we're seeing that a lot. Um, events can't be held, um, and even those that are scheduled into the future in May or June um, are certainly at this point, I think, in question. Um, so what we're what we're seeing, what's what's happening out there? Uh, a couple of things. One, certainly, folks that have donated for the event, if they've bought the ad journal already, put a deposit down, or you know. Um, have you've received payments in that nature already? Um, certainly asking um, you know for the donations to remain, ask the donors for those dollars to, to be retained um, if you think you can do that. But I think what we're seeing a lot of nonprofits doing getting creative and going virtual uh, on events, holding things like an online auction um, and even uh, having other online events like an online gala. Um, where you know you have uh, essentially you're having a, a virtual party online. Um, in this day and age, you know we're all connected to our computers, and it is just another way uh, to to have an event. Um, certainly, it's different, um, but by now, I think uh, you know we all are doing things differently. So this is just one more instance of, you know, how to do things uh, differently. Um, next question, uh, Marcus, this is, looks like it's more uh, in your bailiwick. Okay, let's see. Um, oh yeah, is this a good time to encourage donors to do estate planning? Very good question. Uh, you know, before all of the quarantine and everything happened, we were meeting with a lot of our clients about estate plans. Um, we realized that the tax reform, the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, had increased the uh, exemptions uh, from 5, 5.5 mil to 11 mil. So for a married couple to be able to shelter $22 million is a huge number. Uh, so we were meeting with a lot of clients about this and it is still a good time to do it. Um, for our nonprofits, we wanna make sure again that we're in front of our clients telling them that, hey, remember us in your will. Um, there are still charitable remainder trusts that are available. Um, estate planning tools are, are really being very sophisticated. They're thinking out of the box. Uh, we really, really, really should be uh, encouraging our donor base to, to look at estate plans, um, firm them up, we do have some uncertainty coming up with the election. Um, and a lot of people were trying to put plans apart in, in place and say, okay, I'm gonna pull the trigger at the end of the year after the election. Uh, that's still doable, but you wanna basically encourage people to look at their estate plans, take advantage of the increased exemptions. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen after the election. So you wanna get it in place. The IRS has ruled that any plans put in place in the current year under the current law will be honored. You don't have to recapture any of the um, exemptions that you've taken advantage of. Uh, next question, oh, next question would be me again. I get two for two here. Um, my nonprofit has unrelated business income. What planning should I do in order to reduce my unrelated business income tax? Okay, great, great question there. So first thing, um, if any of the uh, nonprofits got caught up in, a, again, another unfortunate piece from tax reform, the employee commuting fringe benefit, and you had to, for the first time possibly, um, file a 990T and pay tax as a nonprofit on uh, the portion of uh, employee benefits that was considered personal. Uh, we would go right immediately and amend the returns. Our fiscal uh, 18 and 19 year ends, let's get that uh, those amended returns done and get the request for refunds for, for um, taxes that were paid for our calendar 18 and calendar 19s. Um, if you haven't uh, done those returns yet, uh, let's get those 990Ts filed and basically you show no income and basically put in the estimated taxes that were paid and request a refund. That's a, the first way of getting some quick cash back. Also, you wanna look at the uh, interest limitations that we talked about from 30% uh, to 
if you filed your 990T for, for 19, uh, you might want to look back and see if there's a minute return possibly to, to get an increased deduction. Um, you want to look at your tax planning for 2020 and 2021. Look at these refundable AMT credits, 100% of the NOL, again, the business interest limitations and also business losses. Um, you should be sitting down and planning, projecting out how these things are going to impact us. Um, and then also the payroll tax credits. You always want to look at that for the organization. Um, there's no harm in taking advantage of all of these particular tax incentives to get money infused into the organization. Um, last question. Oh, Todd, I guess that's kind of everybody. Why don't you take that one? Okay, so I'll start it off, and then I think uh, I'm going to ask Al, you to comment, then you, Marcus, and then back to me to wrap everything up. How is this a good time for not-for-profits to reimagine their future? So that's a great question. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I don't think, I don't think that um, most people felt that remote work would work. I don't know if that's redundant. Um, but this has definitely proven that you can work remotely and for the most case, unless your work requires some type of face-to-face -face contact, you can get things done efficiently. So the not-for-profit community in looking towards the future, perhaps uh, both may find that they can have team members work from their homes or at least a portion of their time work from their homes. And perhaps they don't need as many individuals on their team. That's one of the things I've been hearing is that the people are saying, boy, I, I don't know if I really need all these people, uh, especially working remotely. And the second, which goes along with it, is space. If, you do, if you're working remotely, you really don't necessarily need the physical space that you have. So not-for-profits and envisioning the future may be actually looking to uh, lease or rent less space because it, most many things could be done um, remotely. So I would expect commercial real estate to um, actually go down in price as businesses, especially not-for-profits, consider that in their budgets. Al, what do you think? Well, um, I think um, thinking about, you know, the employees who are working remotely, you know, um, not-for-profits certainly should be looking and making sure that, um, that they've reinvested enough in their infrastructure. Uh, clearly, technology and the use of technology um, is more critical today than maybe it was before that this started. So ensuring that they've got the right infrastructure in place to facilitate a mobile workforce versus a um, you know a workforce that's all centralized in one location. In addition, I do think that's uh, it, this mobile uh, workforce, the mobility of the employees, provides not-for-profits to promote it as a great uh, benefit, you know, to employees. Um, you know, I think I think the reaction is mixed for employees, whether they like working at home or they like working in the office. But I do think um, folks are getting used to it as we do it longer, and they are going to want to gravitate towards that. So I think it's it's somewhat of a benefit too that not for profits could think about incorporating into their uh, future plans as to how they're going to operate and offer it up um, as a way to retain and attract the qualified people that that not-for-profit not for so you know need to to fulfill that mission uh, marcus yeah just a couple of things to add um uh, staffing needs i think is going to be huge in this uh probably a good time to take a look and make sure we got the right people on the bus um look at our departments um, make sure that the competency is there um, as we move to this remote working environment. Um, you know, people are going to have to be accountable uh, more so. So we need to make sure we've got the right people on the bus. Uh, but also we've got to worry about 
tra uh, training issues. Um, normally, we may have something once a month on, on a training piece. Um, and now, how are we going to do that? Everything is going to become virtual. Also, I worry about knowledge transfer. Um, if staff members working on something uh, for you and they're sitting right outside of the office, they can come in and sit down and go through or you can go out and sit with them to make sure they're not spinning their wheels on something. We've got to make sure we don't abandon that knowledge transfer piece. And also from a tax perspective, um, as more and more um, employees are working remotely, some are crossing over state lines. So I believe, you know, in the onset of this, this pandemic situation, um, a lot of states are going to, you know, kind of turn away from looking at nexus rules and payroll tax rules for their state. Um, once this thing blows through, um, you've got to be on top of that to make sure that uh, having someone work remotely won't um, pull you in or possibly will pull you in to additional payroll tax filings. So uh, that's kind of my piece on it. Uh, Todd? Thank you, Marcus. So this is our last slide. Um, just a few things. This webinar has been recorded and it will be made available as well as the slides, I believe by the end of today or if not tomorrow. If you have any questions, if you haven't sent questions in, um, you can send them to COVID-19 at saxllp.com. And there are two webinars. The one I was telling you about for tomorrow is called Managing and Understanding Forgivable and Unforgivable Loans, where we'll talk a little bit more about the forgiveness aspect of the PPP loan and how to track it. And also Monday, April 20th, state and local tax implications. Come and visit us at um, the COVID-19 Resource Center. and. Uh, you guys can reach out to us anytime. Enjoy this beautiful day. Make sure that you um, you get out and and, and walk around because um, um, you never know when it might rain. So hopefully this, the warm weather will come and wish you all well. Stay well and healthy and we'll see you on um, part two coming up shortly on preparing for the recovery. Take care, folks.